This breakout is called um, Called to Sing. And I, I did something crazy in, in 2020 in the middle of COVID with my kids at home. I decided that was the perfect time to try to write a book on prophetic singing. And I just had a really, really special moment just literally right now. And I got to meet uh, the editor of my book. And I started crying up here. She's in the back today. And she is just a mighty woman of God, just woman of the faith. And I'm just kind of an emotional wreck right now. And so anyway, she edited the book. She's in the room, Edie. I'm just honored that you're here. You're just incredible. So anyway, yay, let's just honor her for being here with us. Um, so anyways, I'm just going to get this out of the way. Um, I'm going to teach this session out of this book that I wrote. And there are going to be copies in the bookstore and in the back. And I just highly encourage you, like, I'm not super great at talking in front of people. Um, but I wrote everything that I want to say today in this book. So grab it. Um, and worship. How many of you guys are worship leaders in the room? Yeah. So I want to encourage you to. I've been getting kind of some testimonies from different churches in the area and um, just all, th all throughout really the, the nation, just different worship leaders saying, hey, we've been resourcing our singers with this book. We've been taking them through um, your book and kind of doing the Q&A together. Um, that's kind of kind of my heart was, was to see that we need to resource our vocalists. How many of you know that a lot of times we focus on our musicians? Because they kind of like make the train wrecks happen <laughs> if they're going to happen. And so we kind of focus on that. Um, and sometimes we kind of just forget about our vocalists, our singers, and we kind of like just just show up. Sometimes we don't make them come to the rehearsals, right? And they just kind of show up and do their thing. But I want to encourage you. Part of what I want to share is the importance of, of our singers, the importance of using our voices, obviously, in worship, but also resourcing our singers. And so, um, so anyways, I created this book. There you go. I did it. Um, okay, so let's just jump in. Who here in this room can sing? Show of hands. Yay! It's a trick question, though. I saw a few of you drummers not raise your hand. I saw it. You know who you are. Uh, so kind of what we have, we've got some singers on worship teams that you're like, yes, I am a singer. And then you've got some singers that are super, like, humble, and they're like, yeah, I guess I can sing, right? And then we've got, like, our electric guitar players that are like, I'm not raising my hands. Like, I don't do that. I saw you, Tom, in the back. Um, but here's, here's what's interesting about that question, is when I ask that question, we all kind of associate a certain measure of skill required for you to say yes or no to that question, right? But the question was, who can sing? And the answer is, it is. It's everyone. We are all called to sing. Um, and yeah, we either measure up to our fake amount of skill that we decided we needed or, or, or we didn't. Um, but you guys, you guys mostly in this room, you know, you can sing, you're a singer. And some of us in this room need to be liberated and set free from some lies from our childhood. That person that spoke that thing over your life when you were 10 and they were like, maybe you should learn an instrument. Or maybe you should play sports. Yeah? <laughs> Some well-meaning individuals. But you know what that did? It locked up your sound. And we're all called to sing. We're all called to offer our own sound. But I just, I'm going to just jump right in right away and, and say, like, I'll tell you my own story. When I was in fourth grade, I... I joined pioneer clubs. I don't know if you know what pioneer clubs are, but it's kind of like Girl Scouts for Christians. <laughs> and uh, so you like earn badges and it's, it was a blast. But um, I, I remember one day I went to our, the pioneer club leader's house 
with, there was like a group of 10 of us girls, I'm in fourth grade, and we're like, we're making candles, and like dipping wax, like the wax and the thing, and making candles, and doing, I don't know, I'm getting badges for making candles, it's so great. But then what happens is us girls are kind of all left to ourselves, I don't know what the leaders are doing, something with the candles, I'm sure, and someone has like a karaoke mic, and we're like passing the mic around, singing, and just like high-fiving each other, just kind of having this fun, this fun time. And the most beautiful, most popular uh, fifth grade girl, she was a year older than me. It was my turn to have the microphone, and I don't remember what I do. I sing something. And she, she kind of looks at me, takes the microphone, and says, you need to stop before you hurt our ears. That's painful, right? I mean, that was just, you know, one moment that I had in fourth grade, and I just, I remember, I do, I remember it, because it was like, it's, and, I, and you know what? She was pretty and popular and probably knew what she was talking about. And so I kind of made this little inner vow as a 12-year-old, okay, good to know. I shouldn't sing in public. Good to know. Like, I need to kind of, I love singing and I, you know, I feel happy and alive when I do. But, okay, like, that word curse kind of like started to sink in and started to do some damage in my heart. And um, I just, I just, I'm going to guess today that some of you may have some similar stories. Uh, two weeks ago, I was at church here and this man approached me, just tears in his eye. I mean, he was, he was visibly crying and he said, he just was like, thank you. I just finished that chapter where you shared about the Pioneer Clubs. And he goes, I was, he, I think he was 12, he goes, I was 12, and I was in this boys' choir and had all these opportunities to kind of like um, do singing, and, and, and my dad suggested that I, I kind of stop him and do sports, and he's like, you know, we're th I'm 30 years later, and I'm realizing I have something to offer the Lord with my voice, and so I believe that it's time, even for some of us in this room, to be set free from some of those word curses when we were kids, when we were adults. You know, maybe you failed an audition at one point. You know, maybe you didn't make the choir. You didn't get the solo, and it just kind of, ooh, right? It, it did something, and it, it, what it did is it locked up your sound, and it locked up some of your worship. And um, I just want to encourage you right from the beginning of this breakout that it's time to sing. It's time to unlock that sound. It's time to, to get free from from those lies that have been spoken over you um hmm. you're called to sing your song right did you know that the most commanded thing in the bible is to sing did you know that over 400 times it says sing to the lord make melody in your heart praise the lord with singing right um when God asks me to do something one time, I'm usually, hopefully, like, obedient, right? When God speaks, we're like, yes, okay, thank you for speaking, Amen. like, I'm doing it, right? When God says it twice, we're like, okay, I get it, I'll do it, right? But God's commanding us 400 times to sing. Like, there is something powerful about your voice, about unlocking that sound, um, and so I want us to encourage and train our singers, our vocalists at our home churches. Like, you can do this. You need to sing. We need to begin to even train, like, our congregations. Like, with your own voice, sing. Like, I feel like I've kind of got, like, as a worship leader, I have, like, a running list of, like, five to ten different ways to, like, encourage my the room to sing with me. Like, I love uh, the worship leader that's coming tonight to lead, Vincent. I love, he, one of his things he says is, give him the fruit of your lips. He's kind of got the South African ac accent, and it is so beautiful. Um, he's, he's, he's like, you know, what I, he's got a, a bunch of really fun ones. I love it. Um, but encouraging our congregation, right? Because we live in a celebrity culture, Western celebrity culture, American Idol, right? Our culture has trained us to not sing. It's actually trained us to listen, right? We love showing up at concerts and listening to the music. And don't get me wrong, I love doing that. Um, 
But we've brought that to the church. We love to sit and listen to the beautiful voices. We're like, oh, we're worshiping together. Well, yes, but there's something about lifting up your own voice, offering that worship to the Lord. And so I think we got to be um, consistently and constantly encouraging our congregation to sing. I'm consistently encouraging some of our, like, BGVs at Radiant. Hey, there's a mic in front of you. Like, please sing. Like, I don't want to do this alone, right? We kind of, even, even, like, in the midst of our, like, worship team, sometimes it's like, oh, let's just all listen to this person sing, and then we'll listen to this person. Like, unity and singing together. Like, let's, let's do this together. Um, and worship is supposed to be different. There's a really big word on this piece of paper, and I'm nervous to say it out loud. Participatory. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> worship is participatory. It's, it's not listening to the, you know, the one beautiful voice. We have a room full of people trained to listen to pretty voices instead of singing along with the voices and adding your own sound to the mix. I want to share with you a Bible story that you already know. It's my favorite. It's Mary of Bethany. She's my girl. And you know the story. I'm just going to tell it a little bit differently. She walks into a room. Jesus is sitting there having dinner with the disciples, some worship leaders in the room, some Pharisees. And she comes in. She, what does she do? She breaks open that alabaster jar of worship, of fragrance. It, it rises up. And what is she doing? She is leading a room and inviting a room into worship, right? What do, the, what do the disciples do? What do the worship leaders, the leaders of the church do? Do they participate? Do they sing along? Do they give to the Lord what they have in that moment? We end up getting a lot of spectators in that moment, right? A lot of people watching. And we even have some critics, too. I think sometimes when we show up to church and somebody breaks open their jar of worship, whether they're on a microphone or in the room, sometimes what do we do? We kind of take a step back and we watch. And sometimes we maybe criticize, right? That's too extravagant. That's too much. And I think a lot of times, though, <laughs> We leave a worship time, and we leave smelling like the fragrance of Mary of Bethany's worship, and we, we think that it was us who gave that. And it's, the truth is, we didn't actually break our own jar of worship. We watched somebody else. We smelled the fragrance of somebody else's worship, and we called it our own. And we're like, I, I did that. Oh, like, God, I want to, every time I show up to worship, I want to offer you something. I don't want to watch my friend worship and, and, and be confused and think I did it. Um, and, and I think it's, it's our culture, I think, that kind of trips us up because, we, again, we love just listening to the beautiful. We're, just, we're trained. We're trained to do that. We're just trained to listen and love it and be like, wow, that was amazing. I was a part of that. And it, there, again, you don't have to just only, there are so, you know, the seven ways, the Hebrew words for, for worship, for praise, right? Lifting the hands, bowing, but one of them is singing. And so, mm. I just, I just feel this really strongly. I don't usually s stick on this so long, but it's so important that we are singing ourselves, that we are obviously worshiping ourselves, but calling the room. Don't just listen to me. Like, I can't do this for you. Like, I'm in, I invite, I invite, I set the table, I invite, I invite, and then you've got you've to break it open yourself. You've got to lift your voice yourself. Don't be fooled that you're worshiping in a room full of worshipers if if you're not, and, you know, 
Jesus on the cross, that spike nard would have lasted months, that, that incense that she offered. And so, you know, she, uh, Jesus is on the cross still being able to smell that worship. I wonder, too, the disciples kind of still having that lingering sense, that lingering smell of, of that offering and that worship. And like, oh, man, I missed it. I'm not going to miss it today, though. I'm going to worship. I'm going to praise. Whew. All right. Just, I felt heavy to me. Okay. Guys, we're called to sing. Do you believe me? Yes. yes. We can do this. We can call our people to sing. We're all called to sing. I love, okay, so Ephesians 5, 19. One of my favorite verses, Paul is talking to the church, and he's training the church. This is how you do it. This is how you worship. And, and it, says, it says that we're all called to bring psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And what's interesting about this is I want to kind of define those for you, but it wasn't just, hey, one person come with a set list. And that's what we'll do. But worship is everyone having something to bring and something to offer. Whether it's a micro, it's microphoned, it's amplified or not, I want to bring a song to the Lord. And so Psalms, it's talking about the Bible. Sing the Bible. I love doing this. When I was like 15, I used to, I used to open my Bible and play a little chord progression. I, I try to play the piano and, you know, just would sing straight through like a psalm. And it was one of my favorite things to do. And it's developed into other things throughout the years. But sing the Bible. Just sing the Bible. Sing the word of God. Um, two, hymns. So when Paul's talking about hymns, he's talking about songs crafted by man. So hymns that we, when we think of hymns, that would be included in that. But also just Songs that are crafted by man. We have professional songwriters that are writing these worship songs, and they're such a gift to the body of Christ. The language in these songs is such a gift. So psalms, hymns, and then spiritual songs. These are the songs of your heart, right? What kind of wells up on the inside of you when you're not singing the Bible or singing a known song, a known worship song? Um kind of just jump into spiritual singing because I want to talk about, uh, or spiritual songs, I want to talk about uh, prophetic singing a little bit too. I have a fun story I like to tell. So it is February 13th. Does anybody know where you can find me February 13th? I'll just tell you. I'm in Meyer on Gull Road in the Hallmark card section. And I procrastinate. And so I am there every February 13th, sometimes the morning of February 14th, if I'm honest, and I'm thumbing through the cards. Where is the card that is going to say everything that's in my heart to say to my husband, right? And I never find that card, by the way. Have you guys found that card? No, it doesn't exist. But for my analogy to work, let's just say I find, there it is. It's like glowing. I find the card. <laughs> I like look at it, I read it. Yep, this is it. This is exactly what I want to say. And I sign it, stick it in an envelope. February 14th comes around and I'm like, okay, Caleb, happy Valentine's Day. Like, I have this card for you. And I, just to heap on the romance, I like open it myself and I'm like, I'm just going to read this for you. <laughs> Roses are red, <laughs> violets are blue. Baby, I love you. And he's like, oh, so sweet, babe, thanks. And fast forward a week to the next Sunday. And he's, babe, what, do you, what, are, you, what are your thoughts towards me? How, how, do you, how do you feel about me today? Or, you know, we had quite a week, you know, and what, what's kind of going on in your mind? Share with me. And I go, oh, yeah, hang on one second. I run to the bedroom, nightstand, fumble through. I don't fumble through. I'm just kidding. It's clean. There's nothing there. <laughs> and I get the card. <clears throat> Roses are red. Violets are blue. Baby, I love you. And he's like, thank you. I love, I love hearing that. But I actually want to hear, like, we had a week. We had shared history together. 
I, you know, I did some things. I spoke some things. What, how do you feel about me? And I'm like, I got the Hallmark card. It's right here. Like, let me tell you. And he, no. And this, so this is, just fast forward another week to another Sunday, right? And the Lord is saying, what do you, what do you want to say? And what do you, how do you feel about me? And what have I done in your life? How do you want to testify of my goodness and my greatness? And we kind of run to the Hallmark card. And like, I don't have the language inside of me. And so those Hallmark cards, right, or those, those songs crafted by man are such a gift because they bring unity and they get us all on board and it's corporate and they help us develop our language and how we sing to the Lord. But then there's this other idea of these spiritual songs this, that Paul talks about, singing the song of your heart and that kind of begins to scratch the surface of prophetic singing of singing the now, right? And when, when God does a new thing, the people of God sing a new song. And it's time to sing a new song. God is moving. I just, I just even to give the obvious example, 2020, God's doing a new thing. Like, things have changed we have new language. We have new language to even develop and give the church in our songwriting because God's doing a new thing. We have new language. I, I think about, so Exodus 15, right? The song of Moses. This is the first prophetic song that's documented in scripture, Exodus 15, right? So the people of Israel, they have been enslaved in Egypt for 400 plus years. And their worship songs that they sing every week, they sound something like, Praise the Lord. We remember your goodness. Would you bring it back? Would you save us? Would you deliver us? We love you, Jesus. Praise you. Maybe not Jesus, God. That's what they would have sung. And they were singing these worship songs for 400 years. But then something happens. God does a new thing. He steps into time and he saves them. He delivers them from slavery in a matter of weeks. They cross the Red Sea. They see all of the plagues. They're at the other side of the Red Sea. They, they see with their own eyes the horse and the rider thrown into the sea. And they realize in a moment, we're, we're, we're saved. We're delivered. God did a new thing. He broke in after 400 years. And what do they want to do? They want to worship, right? Right? But do they sing some of those songs from 400, those past 400 years? Maybe they sung one or two, but here's what we know that they sang. They sang a new song. They had new language all of a sudden to sing. God had done something in their recent history, and they were like, we just need to sing what's on our hearts. And so Moses goes for 18, 19 verses singing, and it's, just, it's literally like, you did this, and then you did this, right? And the hook of Moses' prophetic song is, the horse and the rider thrown into the sea. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider thrown into the sea. And they would never had sung that before. That never happened. But all of a sudden, they had new language, and they, this prophetic declaration came forth. And what started as a prophetic song ended up probably being one of their worship songs that they ended up singing on and on because right you've got Miriam who's in the corner and they they kind of did this thing back then uh where the guys would sing first and then the girls would sing kind of like what we did in the 90s does anybody remember some of those songs um shout to the north and the south you remember that one rise up women of the truth and the men are something I don't I never sung that one I don't know what their verse was um what else? There, there's a couple other good ones. Help me out. Hmm? 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 Yes, yes, there it is. Okay, okay. So that thing, that cool thing we did in the 90s, it was just because of what Moses and Miriam were doing before. So anyways, Miriam's in the corner. She's, the guys are singing their thing, and she's just, she heard the hook of Moses' prophetic song. She hears it, and she's like, that's it? She's like, eyeing her little timbrel that's like a couple feet away. She's like, just come on, guys. And then she grabs the, grabs the tambourine, and they sing that prophetic chorus well into the night. 
I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider thrown into the sea, and there was so much life on it, right? Because when God does a new thing, it's time for the people of God to sing a new song. And so it's time for us as the people of God to sing new songs. It's time to write new songs for the church, but it's also time to sing those spiritual songs as we develop language, as we develop our own history with God, relationship, as we develop that. There needs, there's an overflow that comes out of that. And the church needs to hear some of our overflow and that it will encourage them to start developing their own language as they develop relationship with Jesus. Yeah? Woo! So we're called to sing. Yeah? Um, we're all called to do it. Some of us just have to do it on a platform. <laughs> um... And so for the ones that have to sing on a platform, there's some added responsibility that I haven't talked about. So Psalm 33, 3, go ahead and write that verse down. Um, <clears throat> Psalm 33, verse 3. It says, make a joyful noise to the Lord. And we'll stop there for a second. That's the call to all. That's the call to sing. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. This next part of this verse is for the ones that have to do it on a platform. Play skillfully. <laughs> sing skillfully. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm adding this because this is kind of the room that I'm talking to. Is we, um, we need, obviously, to sing. Encourage the room to sing. But then, um, to the leaders of singing... Sing skillfully. I think, I think when we tell musicians that, we don't even tell musicians that. We're like, hey, if you're a musician, we expect you to like, know how to play your instrument, right? Play it. You learn and you practice. If I, if I was honest, um, or if you guys were honest, how much, how much do we practice singing, Right? As a piano player, if I'm going to have to, you know, play the piano in front of someone, I'm going to practice. Um, with singing, we kind of approach it differently. We kind of all approach it as, like, I have, like, some raw talent, and I don't do anything with it. I don't steward it, maybe. Oof, I hate saying hard things. I'm not good at it. Um, but I just got a year older. Yesterday was my birthday. Thank you. And... I, I kind of hit a scary, like, mile marker in my own head. And it's just, I, I think I get to say mean and hard things now because I got older. <laughs> I'm more of, like, a mother than a sister. I don't know. So I'm going to say hard things. Singers, it is so important. Worship leaders, like, develop your singing voice, you know? We all kind of just, again, we show up and we're like, this is, this is the gift that God has given me. And unlike the other gifts, like, instruments and musicianship, I am not going to try to get better at singing. <laughs> right? But it's important. Like, take some singing lessons. Take, you know, like, oh, this is a great idea. Do a singer-only rehearsal every once in a while. I grew so much. I had a, a worship leader back, like, 15 years ago, and we did singer-only rehearsals just, like, once a month. But man, I felt so valued and honored as one of the background singers on his team. Because I was like, oh, like, you care about what I'm sounding like and what I'm, you know, when I'm singing a harmony. And we kind of like singers just do whatever. Um, but like, what if we honored the BGVs, we valued who they were, what they brought to the table, and we um, encouraged them? to grow. Encourage them to bring a song to the Lord. Bring that spiritual song. Encourage them like, hey, like, sing this harmony then. And then all of a sudden they sing it with a ton of boldness because they have confidence because you called them out. Yeah? Um, <clears throat> so sing skillfully. Is that okay? Yeah. It's so basic. I, oh gosh, I'm gonna, I'll jump on the soapbox one more time and then we'll move on. 
I just, <laughs> I, no, I'm not going to. That was good enough. That's good enough. <laughs> okay. You all get it though, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. So, I loved, <clears throat> I loved what Pastor Lee just shared in the last um, main session. It was so good. And just talking about the tabernacle of David. And we have a big part of that tabernacle of David being the Levites. And so I want to I wanna bring our attention. I'm kind of shifting from place skillfully. Um, and I want to share with you when David set up the tabernacle of David, he he said some things to the Levites, and those are some things that I want to I want to share with you guys. So this is in First Chronicles sixteen. <clears throat> so like Pastor Lee shared, the Ark of the Covenant right kind of finally makes its way safely to Jerusalem, where King David has set up a tent for it. It's First Chronicles sixteen. Four, I want to share. It says, he appointed some of the Levites to minister before the Lord, to commemorate, to thank, and to praise. So first, the Levites, they were appointed. David appointed them. You guys are appointed by God for your role in the church. I want to just... You didn't just accidentally get to volunteer and be one of the singers at your church. You've been appointed. There is real value on what you bring and just even the sovereignty of God to place you where you're at as a worship leader in that church. You've been appointed. Don't quit. <clears throat> God appoints his leaders. One other thing, when David sets up the tabernacle of David, he sets up a leadership structure, right? He's got the chief musician named Asaph. He's got Haman and Jeduthun, and then their sons and different people, right? Have you guys ever seen like the the rogue worship team. Do you know what I'm talking about? They just kind of like show up or the, you know, your, your drummer is MIA and whatever. Uh, or or the, the, I'm not talking about my drummer. Um, um, I, I guess I, because I have the microphone, <laughs> I want to encourage us to be submitted to authority. We, I don't know. I don't know why we feel like maybe we don't have to sometimes or we're like, I'm the worship leader. I'm going to take it where I want to or whatever. But, but just being submitted to, to your pastor, to what, to, to what God is doing in your church, come under that. But I love, I love the detail of the, um, of the authority structure. It's just so cool. Somebody wrote snackies on my notes. I don't know. It's weird. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <clears throat> singers in the room, musicians on the worship team. It's important that you're submitted to the worship pastor, the worship leader you're serving. You're not meant to be a rogue talent doing your own thing. You are, however, a valuable part of the team. I think some of, some of you this morning need to hear that you are a valuable part of the team. Maybe you got dragged here by somebody. And you need to hear that you're, you're a valued member of the team. Hmm. 
Jesus, right now, I just ask that you would come into this room. Holy Spirit, would you speak to the hearts that need to hear their worth and their value, the ones that have been serving for years and have just felt maybe overlooked. I've kind of just felt like you're doing it and here you are and it doesn't matter if I show up and does my, does my voice count? Should I, should I keep doing this? God, I ask right now that you would break in, that you would speak value to these singers, to these worship leaders, to these leaders, Father. Would you remind us the beauty and the dignity of this role to just sing before you, to sing in your presence? God, I thank you for the, the joy and the opportunity just to lift my voice and worship you. Father, would you just stir thankfulness in our hearts? Would you remind us who we are? Would you remind us the, the value of what we do when we lead others into your presence? What an honor. What a, what a beautiful joy to get to do this. We just... Right now, as a room of worship leaders and musicians and singers, we just say thank you, God, for this opportunity to be in your house and to sing. Jesus, thank you. We're so humbled and, and honored and, and just moved that you love to partner with weak voices and you Receive worship when we make these joyful noises to you. We thank you, God. And would you call us again? Would you call the ones in this room again to sing? The ones that have really felt shut down from years ago of lies and word curses the ones that have been getting off the stage and feeling so discouraged, even in recent past, maybe I should just quit. Maybe I should just give up. This isn't for me. Those little kind of cheap shots of the enemy after we get off the stage, that traffic that hits us. <clears throat> Father, I ask that you would call us again. Remind us what you've called us to. Would you give us vision to do this, to sing, to worship? Hmm. Thank you, Lord. So <laughs> we have back to David, Asaph, Jeduthun, Heman, along with their sons, right? God set them up to, to prophesy on their instruments. They probably played multiple instruments. They were really, really skillful. Um, I think Haman had, he had 14 sons and three daughters, and all of them were under the direction of their father for the music in the house of the Lord. Cymbals, stringed instruments, harps for the service of the house of God. Asaph, Jeduthun, they're all there under the authority of the king. <clears throat> So the number of them with their brethren who were instructed in the songs of the Lord, all who were skillful, was 288. And then there was like over a thousand others as well that were jumping in with this. It says um, King David wrote some of his psalms, right, with like Jeduthun in mind um, to lead the vocal choirs and the singing because of his skill and anointing to do so. He was also a skilled harpist. Skill, skill, skill. Interesting. Um, Heman was called a seer in the words of God. A seer is someone who sees by the spirit in the spiritual realm. It's a specific prophetic gift. But these three men are leading the charge with a ton of, of young people under them. 
And what's really cool about this is these guys weren't looking for a platform. They, to be that skilled, they had been doing that for years. On and off a platform, like who knows? I don't know what other, you know, what other kind of like worship was happening when, you know, when the ark was, um, before it got to Obed-Edom's house, it was in enemy territory. And then they have the, the tabernacle of Moses. I just want, I just kind of like, I like to think about like, what were the Levites doing during this time? And it's, it's I mean, it's obvious they were, they were learning in their skill. They were practicing the prophetic. It's, I mean, it says a dozen times that they were prophetic, that Heman was a seer. They were, they were doing this in secret, kind of like David on the back hills of Bethlehem before he was a king, before he played that harp, um, before Saul. He was growing in skill, growing in the prophetic, practicing, hearing the voice of God, um, doing all those things. <clears throat> These musicians, singers, and worship leaders just said yes to the calling on their lives to minister in song to the Lord. And they served faithfully for years, becoming excellent and skilled singers and musicians. They studied the word of God. And when the time came, they were ready. And they became leaders in the house of God. Before the job was glamorous, they were ready for it. Before the job even existed, they had never done anything like the tabernacle of David before. Like their job that they were training for wasn't, a real thing yet, but they were doing it. They were doing the hard work, and then when that moment came, they were ready. I loved. I love to think about too, um, the revival of of worship music that happened during this time. Think about all like most of the of the psalms. Can you imagine showing up to your worship set and King David is like, "Okay, I wrote Psalm twenty three. Here it is. Here's the melody. Let's go." Like, can you imagine? Like, okay, like. Psalm, whatever that he wrote, here we go. One thing have I desired of the, I can't imagine when he introduced that song to the worship team and is like, okay, we're going to sing this, this new language. God is doing a new thing. His presence is literally in a tent now. We all have access. It's not hidden behind that curtain. And here's the songs that are coming forth. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek to dwell in the house of God forever. And they're like, this is what we're doing. This is awesome. And they're, they're singing it. But, um, we're in another revival of worship music. We're, we're seeing musicians and singers from across the globe being raised up and being like, I want to be a Levite. It doesn't make any sense, um, except that God's doing it. He's doing a new thing. And so I think it's so good for us to be aware, one, to do the things ourselves, but we're leaders in this room, and to recognize God's, God's training up the Levites He's purifying the Levites. He's preparing. He's doing a new thing. Um, yeah. Hmm. You guys doing okay? I'm just, I'm feeling the Lord, and I'm just kind of, you guys are so great. I'm going to end with this. Um, so back to these Levites. Back to, I think I said Chronicles, right? First Chronicles, is that where... We, yeah, you guys are doing great. They were called. They were appointed. They were called to minister. Lee, Pastor Lee already talked about this. I want to just remind us again, we are called to minister before the Lord first. As worship leaders, I think we feel pressure to um, minister before the people, to the people. And that always happens as overflow. But if we, if we get the order wrong and we try to do that first, like we fail. So minister before the Lord. It doesn't say David appointed some of the Levites even to minister before the people. Nope. Everybody, we're all ministering before the Lord. That's what we all get to do. <clears throat> so they are called first to minister before the Lord, to, to commemorate. This means to recall, to remember. Think of that old hymn, I Surrender All. You guys know that one? Yeah. yeah. Um, but that verse, here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy 
help I come, keep singing. And I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Yeah. Okay, so this idea of commemorating, I think about here I raise my Ebenezer, right? This idea of um, they would, Israel, um, as they were traveling, they did a lot of traveling when God did something or they wanted to remember his goodness in a specific moment, right? You guys know they would build an altar. They would build an Ebenezer and they would like have a sacrifice and the smoke would rise and then they had to keep traveling. And then when something happened, they would look back and remember, right? The smoke would still be off in the distance. If you were faithful then, you're going to be faithful now. And our, our, our job as, as worship leaders is to minister before the Lord, but then to commemorate, consistently remind our own hearts and remind the people that we're leading um, of the goodness of God. Look what he did, his faithfulness. He's going to be faithful again. This is actually like something that we're called to as Levites is to um, lead the people, lead our own hearts into remembering his goodness. Like this is, this is, this is good. Thus far, the the Lord has helped us. I feel like so many of my prophetic um, songs that I've been singing recently have been remembering the goodness of the Lord. You did this, so I know you're going to come through in this. Like, and and we as a people, I think, um, as a body, like we're needing to hear that right, I, whatever, right now. Okay, um, they are called. They were called to to thank. Thanksgiving, right? Starting with gratitude, Psalm 100, right? Entering through the gates with thanksgiving and then the courts of praise. But um, we need to invite our own hearts and the rooms into thanksgiving. I love David laid this out for us. I feel like I discovered this way too late in life. Oh, this is what, this is what the Levites are supposed to do. Oh my gosh, it's right there in the Bible. Who would have thought? Lead yourself into thanksgiving. Lead the room into thanksgiving. I started doing a thanks, like a thankfulness journal. I, it was like cool to do like eight years ago or something. I started doing that. It was life changing. My perspective shifted. Um, so thanksgiving, Psalm 100. Uh, they were minister, commemorate, thanks. Uh, praise, I think is next. Um, they were to praise. This one we know a little bit more about maybe. We're like, oh yeah, I've heard this before. I'm supposed to lead people into praise. That's my job. Right? It's the expression of adoration from our hearts that's declared to others and to the one we're adoring. By definition, praise cannot be hidden. It's not something we do in secret or quietly so we cannot be heard. If we want to praise a person for an accolade, we do it loud, out loud, in front of them, in front of others. Uh, so that they can hear us. God doesn't need our praise, but he absolutely deserves it. And we need to offer praise. We get unhealthy when we don't recognize what he's done. And we get unhealthy when we take him for granted. When we don't actually give him the fruit of our lips and say it out loud. Praise. Sing praise. Praise is so simple, we forget the power of it. We need to remind ourselves that God inhabits our praise. He shows up in power when we praise him. It's in our praise that he rides in and is glorified. So here's what I want us to do, because I like to just kind of activate and do something practical. I want us to stand up. We've got like a couple minutes left. I'm just, I'm just going to lead us, because I'm a worship leader. I'm just going to lead us into just a moment of just thanksgiving and praise um, out loud. So I'm just going to just begin to sing in the spirit. I'd love if you guys want to join me in just worshiping and adoring our king. So, Jesus, we love you. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, we let it rise. We unlock the sound of our own hearts. We give you praise. We give you praise. You inhabit our praise, so we give you praise. Oh, we thank 
you, Jesus. We thank you. We thank you. We're going to keep going. If it gets uncomfortable, just keep singing. Sing a melody. Tell him you love him. Oh, we thank you, Jesus, for your love. Thank you, Jesus. give you all the glory and we Jesus. Amen. Amen. Guys, thank you so much for joining me and just letting me share out of my heart today. Um, I'll be up front to hang, and then I think my girl Haley's in the back. The, the book's in the bookstore, but if you want to just, like, cheat the line, just go straight back there. Love you guys so much.